Hello. Um, on behalf of the director of the faculty, Professor Teresa Cruz Lima, it's my honor to welcome all, thank you, students, teachers, uh, researchers from SEDS. This is the opening lecture of the PhD programs of Centro de Estudos Sociais da Universidade de Coimbra, SESH. Uh, welcome all the students. Uh, we are delayed, you know. Thank you for waiting. We are waiting for, for Professor Spivak because uh, we need to listen to you and we are waiting to listen from you such a nice uh, lecture. A very special welcome to Professor Spivak. You are, we are very honored to receive you in our faculty. It's a privilege to listen from you a lecture with a very suggestive uh, title. Professor Spivak, you know, uh, he is a legend in social science, <laughs> namely on post-colonial studies and feminist uh, studies, uh, subaltern uh, condition, women rights, and post-colonial epistemology are very actual issues. So, um, we are excited to listen from you, your, your lecture. Please feel at home. This faculty is um, very multidisciplinary. We have um, economics, management, uh, sociology, international relations here. A lot of programs, mainly in cooperation with SES. And um, I think uh, you may feel at home. Thank you for coming. It's a privilege for us. My colleague uh, uh, Adriana Lubiano will introduce you. She is coordinator of a feminist uh, PhD course in Faculty of Arts, University of Coimbra, and uh, she is researcher of SESH also. Thank you. Boa tarde a todas e a todos. Muito obrigada por terem esperado. Foi um dia um bocado complicado. Welcome. Uh, we are gathered here today, we, happy few, um, to listen to Professor Gayatriz Spivak, the opening lecture of the PhDs of doctoral programs from, from, of the Center of Social Studies. Mm -hmm. Professor Spivak was born in Kolkata, she's an Indian scholar, but she did her education, her university education and her academic career in the United States, and she has been a guest lecturer in universities all over the world. She has received all kinds of honors from universities, also from all, all over the world, including different um, honoris causa doctorates. She has written widely on deconstruction, Marxism, translation, feminist studies, post-colonial studies and whatnot. She comes from the field of comparative literature, but she has crossed many borders and her work defies labels and definitions. In her own words, not a specialist, but a kind of generalist thinking about things, her work offers something for each and every one of us. Perhaps the most influential essay is can the Sabbatan speak, which we have quoted many times, misread and misquoted in our research and our own thinking process. No, Professor Spivak defines herself as foremost a teacher, and she has taught us a lot. We have puzzled over and fought over and have had repeated debates about her concepts and her essays. She has taught us about doubt and self-doubt. She has taught us about the ethical imperative of, of imagining oneself in the place of the other. She has taught us paradox as a path to knowledge of things being true together. She has taught us intersectional approach to the subject long before intersectionality was a buzzword in academia. She has taught us responsibility in addressing our fellow humans, particularly the poor, the wretched of the earth, and the dispossessed. 
Chit has taught us the need to listen and being careful in how we read, particularly how we read other cultures. She has taught us that we do not own the planet, that it is beyond our control, and that we are left with damaged reputation. Yet we have the responsibility to the planet, to do something in the planet. She has taught us that there is no abyss between theory and practice, as it is often thought in academia. Her passion for education led her to set up the rural Indian schools, which provide a primary education for children of the rural Indian, in, of, the, of the illiterate poor. She has also taught us the ethics of singularity as an antidote for nationalism and other identity narratives. Identity, all identities create silences and at their own subalterns. She has taught us the value of complexity, the value of the question over the answer the clear-cut certainties that bring us profit. She has taught us that the world needs an epistemological change that will rearrange desires. And I want very much to stress this, and I'm quoting. All this she has taught us in essays <coughs> like Can the Salvatore Speak, Outside the Teaching Machine, Culture talks in a hot piece, thoughts on culture translation of the collection of essays called Other Asia or Other Worlds. The book, Death of a Discipline, is perhaps closer to the issues which will be discussed today. Not that I have any privilege access to what Professor Spivak is going to tell us. That's good. It's about how humanities matter, how humanities and social sciences supplement one another, how things can be true together. An aesthetic education in the area of globalization is the last collection of essays. I'm talking about essays which have been written in the last 20 something years, also address this issue Democracy can only be achieved through a rearrangement of desires, and that can also be achieved through education. And we, as teachers, or those of us who are teachers, have that responsibility. That's what has brought us here to learn. And please help me welcoming again Professor Spiva. Thank you, that's a, no. I uh, just want, however, to correct something, if you don't mind. Uh, my BA is from the University of Calcutta. I was not educated, although born in Calcutta, educated in the United States, no. I left uh, the, um, my, my country in 1961. So my, the BA, I went to a college which was extremely political, Residency College, very, uh, not very fashionable, but very political, very much on the left, and I really learned almost everything that I know there. Because uh, I was in English honors, and my teachers were all men, but both were in Bengalis, who had never been to Britain. They so, and we were the first generation of uh, post-colonial adolescents. And so what we were really taught was how to say yes to the enemy. And that is one of the strongest lessons in any kind of practice, the acknowledgement of publicity, that even at this point, after 52 years of full-time teaching in the United States, in the United States are basically taught rather than learned. Uh, the, um, in, uh, I left, as I say, in 1961. And this is going to take up time, so I'm really not going to talk a great deal about 
other things. But I think it's important for people not to think that although born in India, I was educated in the United States. I left because, at that time, because of the uh, five-year plans, it was not possible for a young person in the humanities uh, to get even a passport uh, because the, the industries that were emphasized, like shipbuilding and so on, get even a passport if she was not able to pay for the trip. Now, I was uh, actually supporting myself. I was 17 years old. I was supporting myself, my mother, and so on. My father was dead. I certainly had no way of supporting myself at all. I worked like a dog to get a first class in uh, my English honors. If you got a first class, then you got the possibility of getting a passport. And it was very hard, 800 students, two first classes, and I had no particular confidence because of the sexism among the students. They certainly said that the only reason why I did well was because I was good looking and so on. There's a, it's not a talk to me. If you laugh at it, I feel pained. It's no joke. It wasn't a joke. Was, even today, I am intellectually insecure as a result of those blows. So therefore, the, um, I managed it. But I was a very bold girl. I was only 18 years old when I became editor of the Dresden's College Journal, which was a regular journal, which was a respected journal. And I wrote a scathing critique of the university. I was a bold person. I, I did not cringe to write this. And so, in fact, I've just read it again, written in Bengali, because people interviewed me last year and said, you know, we hear about this, but we've never seen what you wrote. So I made somebody go back to 1960, the presence of college. It wasn't much three sentences, because there were many other things, but extremely, extremely critical. And I was told by one of my well-wishing professors, Bharat Natsin, you're not going to get a first class in your MA. So, you know, with that kind of criticism. So therefore, I borrowed money from somebody I didn't know, on a life mortgage because I had no collateral and I came because I didn't know if I would get admitted into uh, court. I didn't go to Britain because I was a young person, there was no one to advise me and since I would have to take a second BA in Britain, I thought that was profoundly racist. So since I'd already done a first class BA in Calcutta, so I, that's why I went to the United States because I was obliged to leave my country because I was too critical. That involvement is not something you can write off by saying her entire education was in the United States. I never became an American citizen. So therefore, when I went there, I, I felt that I was a, a subject of uh, critique because I, I dared to critique the place that then sent me off in that way in the United States because, unfortunately, our university system was still completely imitative of London University on the model of which it had been founded 200 years ago. It, uh, I knew how to take an exam. Not that much how to think, but uh, I knew how to take an exam. Photo finish exams. And so, they never, that was in 61, before Lyndon Johnson changed the Alien Registration Act in 1965, at which point there was 500% Asian immigration, professional Asians leaving, and the second generation of that immigration then began to talk about marginalization, uh, ethnic rights, and so on and so forth. The, that particular, before that, things were very different. I certainly had no sense of those things, because those things are written for young people. And so when I came, I took this, and nobody at Cornell, there was no other Indian student in English at all. Can you imagine that today? No. But so therefore, they had no idea of my background or anything. They just saw these fantastic exams, so I made an A-plus average. And their rule for A-plus averages was that the A-plus average student could choose their own, uh, own uh, program which was exactly the wrong thing for me, because I was on the London University model of set papers, right? Set papers, anybody who knows about that model 
that knows that that does not teach you how to choose topics, especially the kind of wild things that quite often uh, the, uh, the research one university offers. And so therefore I just chose, I mean, there I was, 19 years old, I just chose this, that, and the third thing. Luckily, I chose also Paul de Singer because he had such a Samizdat reputation. So therefore, I came out from the, that program, and in, in four years I was an assistant professor. I came out from that program, that graduate program at Cornell, not really with a great deal of what I would call as a teacher, education. And uh, what Demand taught, I really couldn't understand because I hadn't, I didn't have the European substance. I took very, very good notes. And then about two and a half years later, I began to realize what it was that I was learning. So therefore, if anybody in this room thinks that I was born in India and educated in the United States, rethink, friends. You're not looking at someone who was made in the US, no. And so therefore, I have been more useful to the United States because I'm not educated there. It, with my, with my, my sympathy for my students and my you know, ready wit, it's not, I use the word wit in the old sense. The not like a great deal of knowledge, very badly, very ignorant, but on the other hand, this kind of honest intelligence. I think I have been more useful learning from my mistakes than I would have been if I had been made in the United States. But this took a great long time. So, um, but I think it needs to be said. I've heard this said once before, that I came and then I got educated in this. I mean, I, in fact, also, have I taken 15 minutes on this? So, um, so let me also say that um, in the, the idea of what it is for the Global South people to get educated abroad and then claim origin. That is one of the things I criticize most strongly. So therefore, it's, I mean, I was just speaking to some of the uh, Columbia University um, <coughs> global students because they're voting and they had wanted undergraduates, they had wanted me to talk to them for their voting week. And they couldn't even understand when I said that it's not their thing to be speaking about how marginalized they are. I asked them to, to do something else, and I'm not going to get into that because that's not your topic. So therefore, I am really very, I would like you very, very much to think that, uh, think of me as speaking to you from another place. At any rate, the, um, I'm extremely, I really feel quite honored, deeply honored, to be giving this opening talk for uh, the PhD programs, and I hope you will like more or less what I have to say. Yes, indeed, I have given a little bit of a, a, um, a bold, um, a bold um, title, a strange title, but the thing is that I, the, my, the, the title, the words, those are about. Those are about the um, about ways in which one learns. Yes, that's my my title. As you know, begins with study. No, that's more or less the way in which we are taught to do work at the university. <coughs> the object of investigation is an object. You study it. You know it with great responsibility so that you can transfer it. But it becomes kind of infinity. Peter got, got written stuff here, so, um, uh, so I, let me just read it. The, um, the, for my title is that because I've understood my grief as the humanities contributing something to the demands of our conjuncture. It was the old model when knowledge was produced unconditionally if ever that was true, and the learned advice the state has been over for some time. I'm devoted to the intrepid Gramsci who, in spite of being a sick, disabled person jailed for thinking, 
was able to note in a cardboard notebook in jail. You see, people don't think of these things. They just say Gramsci. They don't think of how the, uh, that stuff was produced. Notebook in jail that the intellectual should be a permanent persuader. And behind him was the marks of an unexamined humanism who criticized the exquisite phenomenological method of Hegel as only relating to the mind and undertook to write a phenomenology of capital, suggesting perhaps unwittingly that that philosophy could be breached and supplemented by action. This is what we now critique. Of course, and this is a wonderful place to be saying these things today because the left has united in this country. And this is, I mean, given, given what the situation, you know, I come from a place where, second international communism, where a little while ago the left was, basically the left party in power was destroyed by female females, but nonetheless, the, which is also a sadness, the, uh, but at any rate, so therefore, given the fact that in my country, the 17 left parties are making alliances that make it completely indistinguishable from the right, and also I'm coming from opening the Marxist Feminist Congress in Lund, which is rather dif different from India, the, and there too, you know, Delinke, the, the party which is supposed to be the Marxist Feminist Party, is making such incredible, horrible, um, uh, alliances with the left, that once again one begins to feel that a genuine alliance, alliance of left parties is something that one should congratulate. And so therefore I'm extremely happy to be able to be speaking in Portugal, given what's happening in the United States, where uh, Kavanaugh has just been confirmed, and in India, where um, just recently four million Muslim citizens were, uh, were disfranchised. They were not counted in the national census register. So given my place of residence and my place of citizenship, to be here and to hear that the left is doing well, I'm very pleased about this. My own training, on the other hand, which you will see here, I've just given you a little uh, idea of where my title comes from, to question, study, and know, and then pass on knowledge. My own training is what uh, is in a, a group called the Frontier Group, from which was established more or less in 1968, is left of the left critique of the parliamentary left, which is supportive but critical. And it seems to me that perhaps at universities, that is the position that you probably hold toward the parliamentary left as it, as it toils along, having to survive in a finance capital world. So to an extent, I feel, this is just my conjecture, but I feel a stronger alliance with the PhD students here in the, in the Center for Sociology with feminist studies and a Venn diagrammatic relationship with it and the humanities. The, um, I feel, I conjecture, I, I guess that uh, probably you are more in sympathy with the kind of training which I still cannot leave behind, left of the left critique of the parliamentary left when the entire union and the world is not on the left. See, therefore, uh, I'm very happy about this. Now, as I said, <coughs> Marx, perhaps unwittingly, thought, this is my kid working properly. If I lower my, uh, lower my head and read, it doesn't get me, right? But then when I lift my head, I have to do this. <laughs> I may forget, just make signs. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, so Marx uh, felt that it, this, that philosophy, Hegel, could be breached, supplemented by action. To supplement <coughs> is to question a system's totality by introducing a dovetailing wedge, which yet signals danger. All that is tamed by my question mark after the word do on my list. Do has a question mark. The relationship between knowing and doing, named here by the textuality of the situation, is also normed by the textuality of the situation. Textuality of the situation. Normed. Now what do I mean by textuality of the situation? Everybody feels that this is a highly theoretical university. But when I, I normally don't speak, there's too much resistance to theory in most universities these days. 
So most people, and in fact, my very, very dear friend, Edward Said, resisted. He was not, not a fool. He was a very smart man, certainly more intelligent than I am. But he, and he was a very dear friend of mine, but he resisted all through our friendship from 1974 on. He resisted understanding that the word textuality meant like textile, a web of many strands, rather than just the printed page. And but today, when we are getting trashed because of the unfortunate Avital Ronel um, uh, um, incident, which some of you may not know, the people who are coming forth, of course, anything like that happens, what they say is that deconstruction is bad. What does that have to do? I mean, two people harassing each other sexually, suddenly deconstruction is bad? But deconstruction is bad. And we, Judith Butler and myself, etc., we were all described as ugly women who had to write all of this stuff. I don't think we're particularly ugly. I think we are fucking pleasant looking women. But at any rate, we, and, but they could not, they, they, they were talking left, right? And they quoted Chomsky. Now Chomsky is not a fool, and uh, he is not, he's not going to say, he's never really written on deconstruction, therefore, he's not going to say something that is not correct, but he's, he'll go as far as he can to keep it on the left as it were. So what he says is, deconstruction gives you many truisms, as you know in English truism is like an obvious truth type thing, right? So, but that is what the instruction does. It points at things that are so obvious that we ignore them in theory. So I'm constantly quoting Chomsky now, just the word truism, when I use words like textuality. I say, Chomsky knows that this is true, that, that, that any situation, that way I protect myself from the, the vulgar Marxist left. But at any rate, so, so the thing is therefore, it, these, these things are normed by the textuality of the situation. The, um, the relationship between knowing and doing. You think you know, you go to apply, you want to do it. You know this, this is an obvious thing. It's normed like Tongyem, not like Foucault, right? Normed uh, polemically, as Tongyem said, Foucault changes it to politically. But, so that's something that we know. For a long time, we have stopped looking for unity of theory and practice that used to be the word, watchword when I became a communist at the age of 15. Unity of theory. All right. Now, it is the gap between the two, theory and practice, that the humanities inhabit. It is in that conviction that I take shelter as I look at the contours of your Center for Social Studies. And I actually looked at the list of courses and made notes but because I was already late, I didn't go back to the hotel room when I realized in the cab that that piece of paper is still in the hotel room. I'll try to do it since I won't have that much time. I'll try to do what I can, okay? So I have given a list of epistemological imperatives in the title. In the abstract, I have described them as cognitive variations. These words are used loosely. I do not intend to give scientific precise definitions of each term that you can approve or disapprove of until the next set comes along. No. The literary academic within humanities, as I have already indicated, makes an appeal to the imagination. Neither rational nor irrational, neither unreasonable nor unreasonable. It is an instrument of the supplement that opens up the security of the institutional intellect, moving us toward the unavoidable randomness of life, norming knowledge into danger. I will be speaking a practical, I will be speaking a practical pedagogic language. And take my motto from Gregory Bateson. Let me see if I have his. In, in, who was impatient with rarefied explanatory gestures, controlling through power knowledge. Gregory Bateson, the theorist of the double bias, who knew both affect and diagnostic psychology, wrote, statistics and book learning are useful, but in the field of action, we must also not only remember, 
that all science is an attempt to cover with explanatory devices and thereby to obscure the vast darkness of the subject. To cover with explanatory devices and thereby to obscure the vast darkness of the subject. That doesn't mean we stop investigating, but that's the supplement, that the reminder that as we try to control through studying as responsibly as possible, through knowing. I mean, that's why I read the list of your courses, you know, the description of the courses that are given. Because one must study and know as much as we can. But nonetheless, I work in the conviction that Bateson describes so beautifully, all science is an attempt to cover with explanatory devices and thereby to obscure the vast darkness of the subject. None of these imperatives is to be laid aside. Study and know is, are very important. I am simply expanding our usual institutional mandate contained in the first two, study and know. In that position, our investigation focuses on an object. We go into each of the many directions indicated by the object and thus come to quote, know it, study and know. The move is egological. The lineaments and contents of the object have taken on the substance of the ego and can be imported and infinitely reproduced on the assumption that the insubstantial substance of the formalizing ego is universally equivalent. So I can teach you, because it's the same substance, your knowing ego and mine. So therefore, it goes through books, etc. The universally, therefore, the, the assumption that the insubstantial substance of the formalizing ego is universally equivalent, amenable to the abstract average, on the way to, to data control. This is something that one needs to know even in the qualitative social sciences. You have in front of you a paid teacher of the literary humanities. She must at all times be mindful of our world's wealth of languages. The imperative to quote, learn, which is the next one, learn, learn, and then comes here, listen. The imperative to learn is therefore to learn by heart, and the expression is aggressively rather than only necessarily metaphorical. Because even study and know, those are also metaphorical, even as metaphors are logical. But the learn, the, mo the moment you move it, it becomes aggressively metaphorical. The metaphor in, in, in English, and in order to quote, translate it into meaningful action, a synonym for you Portuguese, for me English, will not serve, although dangerously, it will seem to do so, and control the supplementary action of learning to knowing, questioning its infinitely repeatable totality, in practical fact, infinitely revised, in English at least, a doctoral dissertation being a, quote, significant contribution to the existing body of knowledge. So already, it is a kind of supplement. It is not, knowledge is not a totality. There is, I mean, this is, these are truisms. These are such obvious things. It's a that, well, that can be true. It doesn't mean anything. I'm producing knowledge in my dissertation. Here, what is translated is the cluster of thoughts rather than words in the narrow sense, giving a synonym is not going to be any good. In my mother tongue, it translates synonymically to located in the mouth, mukosto. Does anybody know Bengali at all? No. The, um, it, that's, it, in my mother tongue, that's how it translates. If one looks carefully at the shifting metaphorical trans translation problems in as many languages that we know, some hopefully outside of the Indo-European or Chinese Ar Arabic circuit, the best known ones, we might be, of course, I'm thinking about Africa, we might be able to suspect that what is being hidden is the change in subject position. If the study no claimed interdisciplinarity strengthens and trains the investigator as responsible subject, and what is investigated remains the object, in the learning situation, the subject position shifts to that which is learned. 
often not a real subject at all. We are in the training place of imaginative activism because you can't just construct, you see, when you do these alternative epistemologies, I'm very sorry to say that most of these things are really kind of class continuous useless things coming from uh, people in the so-called global, they're, all, they're for sale. People in the global south, if they could talk about alternative epistemology, 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 epistemologies, they're not practicing them. It's a, it, this is a very, very different ballgame, alternative epistemology. And I do say something about the public, in the published thing uh, as to how, what alternative epistem epistemologies would be like. I'm not going there. But the work, because obviously I've given myself absolutely no time. So I, I do not say this, I'm not talking about that. The, so learn, the learning situation, the subject position shifts to that which is learned often not a quote real subject at all. We are in the training place of imaginative activism. I cannot expand upon this here for lack of time, but I do want to say that the alternative epistemologies now on sale from the Global South belong to the study, now apply circuit. And there is a certain kind of reverse racism in saying, oh yes, look ma, we are alternative, alternatively epistemologizing. <laughs> no, sorry. But the thing is, that I would now, I have, if I am right, I have actually almost taken for five minutes, so let me just go very fast. Now the here, learn, after that is here. I'm not talking, you see, I can't really tell you how it is done. You can't teach the piano by talking about playing the piano. And also, because this imaginative activism is a doing, right? That's why do, question and you can't actually do it, as Wittgenstein famously said, in one lesson anyway. So if you are curious about this, we'll talk more. I don't know how, but one can find easy, easier ways of talking these days than one could when I was young. But at any rate, the, the, when you move from this learn, the study now is easy. Uh, hard, but easy, if you know what I mean. But then, the, and, and it must be done. Institutional validation must be based on studying them. But then, and one mustn't just say, you know, I really know everything because I'm an alternative epistemolo epistemologist. I'm really learning, so I won't study now. One doesn't uh, avoid homework in that way if one is at a university, especially as good as yours. But on the other hand, when you move from the extraordinarily difficult uh, arena of learning, as I was describing it, as the subject position shifts to that which is learned, that's what the humanities do. The, the humanities, the digital humanities, the history of literature, that ain't humanities. The, the real task of the humanities is different from the, the gen. That's why interdisciplinarity is a very strange game. So at any rate, the, when you move to here, the metaphor is shifting almost completely to oral here. It's shifting into a place. This is, this is not something that I can then scientifically describe through brain movement. You know what I mean? I'm actually confronting the vast darkness of the subject. When I teach, I begin to be able to recognize a moment when and this is very, very rare because it's against the most established tradition all over the world. Don't think that because other places are different, they are therefore alternative epistemologies because Europe is the only place of reason. Don't think so. You go into rational critique in India, you will find something tighter than your study now problem. You go into the Dahomeys and the seven generation memories and so on and so forth, you'll find something tighter than you study no stuff, except the writing is a memory. So therefore, the place where you can find something, but not by just being reverse racists, is in the unsystematized first languages of Africa. And believe me, that's an extraordinarily hard field, because everybody is in a very, uh, very benevolent, feudal way interested in preserving them and not acknowledging how they have been survival languages because that's extremely difficult to acknowledge in the ready way. So therefore, that here metaphor is one which brings us into the oral. What happens? Again, I can't 
you can kick me out. I said, yeah, she just talked about things. She gave no examples. I said, right, I'm giving you no examples. Because that's, the, that's that darkness of the subject. But in fact, when one begins to work together, when uh, the humanities are in a situation of teaching, then, you, I mean, I'm just coming from my, my village schools, right? In fact, directly, in fact, I put on these clothes uh, there saying they've never seen me in these types of clothes because these are urban clothes that are the bottom line of what I can wear here. So th they don't have access to clothes of this sort, so I don't wear them there. They know that I don't wear my, you know, urban Kakata uh, clothes, America, they can't, can't even imagine. Uh, they, they know I don't wear, they laugh. I mean, I wear very crazy clothes because I can't quite go into their taste thing it's unless I want it to be really kind of benevolent because I don't particularly like the kind of taste thing that's produced there and that's quite clear to me, I don't say anything like that. But anyway, I put on these clothes yesterday morning saying, look, I'm wearing these because I'm going to, and I showed them on the map where Portugal was, and I, I'm going to that place and it's possible that my plane will be late and I won't be able to change, at least I'll be able to lecture in these clothes. You see what I mean? So I, from these, and that's it, that's exactly what's happened. I'll tell you. And they've never seen my legs in such tight casings, no. But they did, you know, maybe. But at uh, treat distance to see an old lady's legs in such tight casings, they wouldn't care what I wore, like they didn't care in the morning. But because, you know, I'm like a powerful, rich Calcutta person who runs their lives through them, and you know, etc. Anyway, why am I mentioning all this? Because in that situation, Ben Baer is with me, right? He just, we just left each other in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. He's a white Englishman, right? He works uh, with me there um, and has been for the last four years. He's a Columbia PhD, right? And, you know, he was learning Bengali not because I particularly had asked him to learn Bengali. I didn't even know he was. It's because he had, he's British. He'd read something somewhere where I, I had said that if you want to study European colonialism, you should learn one of the languages well, because otherwise those who were born into the language, like me, they will, they will, they will blackmail you because you don't know the language, and they will say, we are good, you are bad, and research will be foregone conclusion. So, in, in the, like, you know, colonizers were good, we colonized were always very good. The colonizers were bad, we colonized were always very good. And, uh, that was the piece of nonsense. You can't really have research of that sort. And hearing that, Ben had started learning Bengali. And so when I saw that he had, I helped him because Bengali taught in Colombia is an edited language for migrants and so on. That's not serious. So then he translated a novel, etc. And then, why am I telling you this story? Because I'm talking about how examples are earned. You know, then one day when he was learning from the American <coughs> Institute of Indian Studies, Bengali, because of this, I go to his uh, apartment because I was putting my luggage down to go to the villages. I go to the toilet. I find that, you know, I don't, can't find toilet paper. So I come out and I say, look, Ben, I'm very, very sorry. I couldn't complete the toilet paper, so I'm afraid. Your toilet is a bit like a Bengali toilet, a washing water. So he, the big, white guy, he's saying like this, hey, hey. So I'm practicing without toilet paper because I want to go to the villages. That's earning the right. He's re-inscribing his body. That ain't easy. Even Stuart Hall told me when I said to him, you know, that's, what, uh, that's how we grew up, washing our backside with our left hands at home. Stuart said to me, that's where I draw the line. Okay, so Stuart, whom I adore, whom I adore, so therefore, this is, now Ben and I, therefore, you know, we uh, work together in the villages, living there, not flushing toilets, backside, left hand. So, I think again, when something changes like this, when you see that some hearing metaphor, this is not easy, this training, there's some, because you can't do it in libraries, some hearing metaphor is emerging after the fact because teaching in those classes is like sinking or swimming because it's so different from teaching uh, at Columbia. We will, in the evening, we will perhaps sit down and say, my goodness, something happened. And you know, so that it surprises you. It surprises you because it's not something that you plan. There are lots of things you plan and some of those things also happen. It's another romantic something that I'm talking about. But that shifting into here, 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 what do you hear? 
exactly what the study no model does not allow you to. Because if you hear something in the study no model, your obligation is to transform it into the study no model. And you do something new. Subaltern studies, the historians, they were in that area. They were trying to hear and transforming the hear into, some, into the study no model, <coughs> subaltern studies. That's, that's fine. I'm not against it. I'm, I teach at a university. But nonetheless, that one, you can't say Spivak gave no examples, because the examples emerge in a different way. And because we are losing that kind of imaginative intellectual labor on the top, because, of, because digital idealism is saving intellectual labor. It's a labor-saving device, but intellectual labor should not be saved. And at the bottom, because in a class apartheid model of education, the largest sector of the electorate is not allowed the right to intellectual labor. So all in all, this kind of thing is an endangered kind of teaching. But nonetheless, it's something that I don't think is going to die altogether. Then the next thing was listen. Of course, it's the listening is a more focused uh, attitude toward the hearing. And then the next one was do, question mark. Now what I want to say, and in conclusion, I could have said a lot more, is that one example I could give you is the narrative of how, through my mistakes, I have moved from subaltern studies into, into something different, learning, hearing, and so on. And even yesterday morning, the, the training, the last day, is a training of all the teachers and the supervisors into the possibility of a democratic pedagogy for the largest sector of the electorate, which is very, very poor in all of the world, especially the tri-continental world. There, Ben said later, you know, this was very good today. It was quite different, wasn't it? I said, yes, it was different, because I learned something this time, too, from the mistakes made last time. So when you, in your courses, study democracy, think of the fact that you know, the idea of democracy, that very hospitable, very hospitable um, system, which allows anything to establish itself if it, is, uh, if it follows the rules, that the, the uh, arithmetical uh, practice of democracy, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote, which came later, that particular structure of democracy, clean elections and so on, that does not produce a democratic society. It assumes a democratic society. It's a performative contradiction. And the so-called democratic society will never, ever be there in terms of just following the so-called democratic imperatives. Our work, which is with the largest sector of the electorate in Africa and Asia, not so much in Latin America, in fact proves this again and again and again. So that what we are dealing with here is producing a will for social justice all around rather than enforcing changed laws of one sort or another. It's good to change laws, but law, just, I mean, I know from South Africa, as you do, changing laws does not change minds. So therefore, this particular enforcement does not do anything. And if you think about the entire area of the world today, which is the new Khilafat, in fact, all of these things, they prove to an extent what I'm talking about, a kind of teaching which is so different that it, cannot ju it can only supplement the establishment of the study no projects in the great research universities, because otherwise, you are not actually, you're talking about the global south, but you're talking about a class continuous global south that claims itself to be the global south. This is something, this cannot be broken. This, is, this cannot be broken. The, the digital world allows you to do this. But this is a way in which capitalist globalization produces organic intellectuals. So this is something that really uh, intellectuals, organic, to that mode of production. So to an extent, what I'm talking about here, which I cannot talk about 
because it is really not something that you talk about, you do. It's like taking you out into the field and say, learn a language or two or three and come with me and let's try this one. It's very, very small, very one-on-one, -on -one, takes a lot of labor, the exact opposite for all of the networking convenience that allows you. I'm not against anything digital, but the humanities should supplement the digital rather than, in fact, become uh, unquestioningly digital. The digital can be on tap for the humanities, not on top. So to an extent, I wish I could go on a little bit more. I will just read for you the um, way in which our brother Fano describes the postcolonial, a little bit of Weber, which you know very well, but that third chapter of Fano, people don't read, and I will just leave it. Okay, good. So just a quote. That's not me. All right, so let's find that thing. All right, here we go. Here's Fana. You know, it's so strange that in India, at least, it seems like he's describing Modi. It's amazing. He uses the English word leader, and he uses the word caste. Here's Fana. The leader will unmask. He's describing post-colonial society. <laughs> this, uh, this is correct. But you, you know that, uh, that, uh, that film uh, concerning violence, right? Where the guy, the Swedish guy, just found some stuff about Mozambique and Angola, and I'm speaking about this because of Portugal, you know, and he decided that that just describes colonialism at large and proves for now. So, totally mind blowing, you know. I mean, if you really lo look at Mozambique and Angola, you look at the fact that they were bringing women from Macau and Goa in order to marry uh, the characters because they would not marry Africans. You were, you know, that's a gender thing. If you really look at uh, Socrates' uh, uh, The Platonic Republic, and you look at the uh, stuff on democracy and the six ways of uh, being a citizen, Politeia rather than the Republic, which was Cicero's deliberate instruction. But at any rate, the, um, when you look at that, you see that every change is actually gendered. How does it change? The mother gives bad advice against the father, and a new subject is produced. Who looks at that? So, to an extent, the, uh, that's why I'm saying that postcolonial easily said. You know, I'm very glad that the Bra that the Brazilian students here apparently are voting uh, left because uh, with the shaking of fear. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> okay, so let me just read. The leader, Fano writes, will unmask his inner purpose to be the CEO of the Society of Profiteers intent on getting the most that constitutes the national bourgeoisie. The leader constitutes a screen between the people and the grasping bourgeoisie because he lends his support to the entrepreneurship of this caste, caste is his word, and turns a blind eye to its insolence, mediocrity, and fundamental immorality, the elite of the global south, only too ready to give you alternative epistemologies when they're at universities. He helps to curb the growing awareness of the people he lends his support to this caste and hides its maneuvers from the people, thus becoming its most vital tool for mystifying and numbing the senses of the masses. Today's post-colonial nations, tyrants at the head, all over the world, including the United States, the, the largest sector of the electorate under uh, apartheid education, class apartheid education, rape culture and bribe culture normal, the best bride arrayed. The, then I'll just read the uh, Weber stuff and that's it. <clears throat> Such leaders use the so-called democratic structure to preserve the patrimonial state running on patronage. When you please learn about democracies in other parts of the world, this has to be thought about. They rule over a, quote, hybrid that includes aspects of a modern state. The machinery of the state expands enormously, particularly in public welfare and in the economy. But patrimonial relationships, patronage relationships, and reciprocities remain significant, while the rule of law, central to bureaucratic authority, is shallow. This, this particular thing is so clear. I'm coming from India, and I'm a citizen, so therefore I have to go through these things. It is so clear 
And I also deal with subaltern folks who are supposedly citizens, who have body count voters, but don't get the privileges of citizenship. So therefore, what I would like really to say, and there is so much more to say, is that when you think about this model, think about the fact that the idea of how we do our social science work is something that has to be shook up epistemologically undone and another way thought through in order for us to become fitting to the, what the demands of a globalized, digital, easy, speedy uh, kind of learning process conjuncture is. And unfortunately, the more powerful the other side, the, the more difficult the demands on us. And that's what some of us are trying to say. You who try to bring the humanities and the social sciences together, just remember interdisciplinarity ain't so easy. A discipline actually molds the way you think so that you begin to think that that's the only way to think. The historian is imaginative, but the, the, the claim to validity, truth claims, are so different for the historian and the philosopher, the need for the counterexamples. This, this is so different from the literary, learning from the singular and the unverifiable. This is so different from the legal and so on, that we should protect the fact that we speak from one disciplinary formation and try somehow in that learn way, learn way, when the discipline itself becomes as it begins to, the other discipline begins to occupy a subject position, even as I'm steering the boat of the discipline that has made my mind think this way. So I just want to state, say to you again and again, don't forget that the claims on intellectuals such as you are, young intellectuals, today, because of the immense convenience created by the digital world as it helps you save intellectual labor is not completely to give in and realize that to hear is becoming almost impossible. NGO style hearing ain't hearing. I should have read, and I'm not going to, a little bit on human rights that I wrote for Frontier at 50, uh, the journal that um, that moved us into that way of uh, left of the left critique, but there is no, no time for it. So I'll just observe my computer, but I can't read it. But I won't end there. So I'll end just here with an inconclusive conclusion, which is also appropriate for this kind of time. Thank you. Thank you.